Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. I just ran the math on how many arrows a higher level character can put down range in a minute and it's really hurting my brain. 5th edition so a level 20 fighter samurai with haste up and under ideal circumstances can make an absurd number of attacks. Here's the breakdown. 4 attacks base rapid attack giving an extra shot, again ideal circumstances and assuming he has some way of getting advantage every round, haste gives another attack another 4 attacks in the first round from action surge. So, 10 attacks in that first round followed by 6 attacks every round thereafter for a grand total of 64 arrows fired in under a minute. That's slightly less than a second per arrow. It can actually go higher if you have another fighter, or 2 or 3, nearby with commander's strike to give you another 10 arrows per minute for a total of 74 arrows in 60 seconds. That is absolutely terrifying and I'm not sure I was mentally prepared to deal with this information. What the hell would that even look like I know you can get more attacks a minute with the right weapon. Glaive and Podium Master for example gives another 10 attacks a minute for a total of 84, but there's something about a bow doing it that's just crazy to me. Any other mechanical D&D weirdness to share edit, had it pointed out you can actually action surge twice at level 20, thank you, for an additional 4 attacks. So 58 arrows in a minute without magic or outside help and up to 78 arrows with haste and someone using commander's strike. It was also pointed out that all of this can be done with a hand crossbow and the crossbow expert feat but with the added advantage of yet another attack every round thanks to the bonus attack from the feat. So a level 20 fighter can fire 88 crossbow bolts from a perfectly ordinary hand crossbow over the course of a minute. Now granted. With the bow and arrow 60 off shots a minute is theoretically possible, with complete lack of accuracy but still, but somehow firing faster with a crossbow that's just freaking bizarre. Edit 2. If you can get a ranger to cast swift quiver into a spell storing ring, then use a casting of swift quiver on yourself, you can make another additional 20 bonus action arrow attacks over a minute. So with full magic support in place, your level 20 samurai can lose 98 arrows a minute. See I'm fine with this on a mechanical level I just really can't visualize what 100 arrows a minute even looks like. Kedit 3 have also been informed in the comments that all this pales into comparison to the bullshit that is ranger with the volley ability. A ranger using volley can target every creature a 25x 25 foot cube. Every creature within 10 feet of the original targeted creature. If that cube was to somehow be fully occupied by pixies, with 4 pixies per square because they are tiny, you'd have 500 pixies. Every last one of these pixies can be shot at. This takes an action to do so you can only make one such attack in a normal round, but with action surge from a fighter dipper ranger can potentially fire 5500 arrows a minute. Or about 5 times faster than the average machine gun. My players spent 2 hours in the first room of my dungeon yes, as the title suggests my players did indeed spend 2 hours in a single room of my dungeon during our last session. Before I get into why they spent 2 hours in this room, let me start by saying that this room was empty. There was no puzzle to solve, no items to find, no enemies to fight, and there was not one, but two obvious exits to the room, that also doesn't include the entrance they had come in through. So, you may be wondering why why did they take so long to move past this room well, this was a combination of several factors. Kind of a lesson to be learned from in the future about what you put in front of your players and when you do so. Firstly, I should point out that while this was technically the first room, it was the first room of the second floor of a more expansive dungeon. A wizard's tower which the party had spent all of last session fighting their way through to get to that point and had just defeated a boss when we left off. So, they were actually sitting in the boss room from the previous session. A puppet-like construct boss which was particularly nasty what with having 4 arms, 4 weapons, and 2 faces each with their own initiative. So, the party was hurting on hit points, and had blown a fair amount of their spell slots. Given the situation they decided to have a short rest to heal up a bit. Which was just fine, 
nothing I didn't expect there. The rest also gave them time to switch out their party members since one of the members a sent to a paladin we didn't have last time was with them now, while one that they did have last session in Elf Ranger was not playing that day. So, I simply used that rest time to say that the ranger ran back the way they came and pointed the paladin in the right direction to catch up to the party. This is where I made a mistake. You see the party had come across a magical artifact in the lower floor of the tower. A very movable rod. Those who are well versed in D&D will know that an unmovable rod is a very popular and powerful item that looks kind of like a cane with a horse head on the end and a single button. Pressing the button will cause the rod to become magically transfixed in place, effectively becoming unmovable unless you can either beat a DC 30 strength check or apply upwards of 8000 pounds of force on the rod. This item wasn't that however, this was a very movable rod. For some context the person who controlled the tower the party was in was a 200 plus year old artificer with a habit of making silly or downright crazy contraptions. The very movable rod was one such creation, and basically what they did is they just took an unmovable rod, and made it do the opposite of what it usually does. So instead of not being able to move, it becomes unable to stop moving if it is turned on and then any force is applied on it at all. The players didn't know this and obviously they're going to want to try out their new magical item now that they have a moment of peace to do so. However, the range was actually the person who had the rod and they weren't going to be there. Feeling generous I decided to say that the ranger passed off the rod to the paladin as they passed each other. That way they could test out the item. That was my second mistake. Since of course the paladin decided to try and use the rod right away. First tying themselves to a support beam and then pressing the button. Nothing happened at first of course, but the second they moved their hand at all, the rod just went. I gave them the chance to make a strength check to keep it from slipping out of their grip which they made, and a dexterity save to try and turn it back off which they failed. Since the rod couldn't be turned off it just continued to pick up speed, smashing through the wall of the room, then another, and another, and another until it was completely out of sight. Then one of the players posed the question of what is going to happen if it keeps picking up speed, fearing that it might destroy the whole realm. Obviously, I'm not that mean so instead I just have it become so fast that it loses its physical form and rips a hole in the fabric of reality right in the middle of the room where the players are. Yes, it created a wormhole. Of course, I mainly did it as a joke, but the players couldn't just leave a wormhole undealt with. So, they started communing with their gods to find a way to close it before it could widen and destroy the realm. I had one of their gods give them a way to contain stabilize it so that it wouldn't become any larger. However, once they knew it was safe to be around, they started jamming things in it to see what would happen. So, then I had to decide what would happen. It started with a rock, so I just said a different rock popped out, because I decided it was connected to alternate realities. The players picked up on this and began to experiment more. One jammed a magic sword through it and I tossed out a magic bow since our ranger was new and still needed magic equipment. Our warforge cleric fight didn't like the short bow I gave him though so he kept shoving until I gave him a long bow. Then the paladin decided he wanted to explore the other side, so I had to send an alternate version of himself through the other side dead as doornail, to dissuade him from doing that. Then they started shoved in things from enemy characters they had killed into the hole and alternate versions of those characters popped out, alive this time, and less evil. So, then I had to have those NPCs explain what their version of reality was like in case they had any useful info the players could use. Which I had to come up with on the fly. Overall the session was all that bad, and the players liked having the extra NPCs to help them in combat. But this is why the players can't always have nice thing. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps.
If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Apparently, one hour of math equals declaration of war crimes. Be me. Forever DM midway through what ends up being a three year long almost entirely homebrewed 5e campaign. Be not me, half dwarf half gnome wizard artificer with necromancer aspirations. Rest of party. So a little bit of setting for this. I had made a lot of this campaign up, and one of the spells I had allowed my players was transmute liquid which changed one liquid into another. Usually this was used either for turning random sludge into clean drinking water, water into wine, or the beer in someone's mug into moospis. Hilarious prank by the way, but story for another day. This spell was designed as a cantrip, as you'd only be making a small amount for yourself, but we had at one point rule that you could change larger volumes if you expended a spell slot. Higher spell slot equals more volume changed. Throughout the campaign I had set a pretty stringent precedent that if whatever you're doing, or trying to do, would work with real work physics, I'll allow it. This was about to go poorly. Cue my Dwayum best friend player getting into a situation he couldn't handle. Being alone, having portailed in near the BBEG's lair, or what the party thought was the lair, in order to scout it out. Player was attacked by more angry ghosts than he could handle, so what does he do? He uses transmute liquid on the lake. 5th level spell slot. Okay, I'll allow it. I want to see where this is going to. 5 minutes later we figure out that's the volume of an Olympic swimming pool's worth of liquid. 2.5 million liters, or 660,000 gallons for our imperial friends. Still not sure where he's going with this. I finally ask, okay, what liquid are you trying to transform this water into? Player, knack. Me, knack. Player, knack, firmly. Much science later to find out what this even is, and many roles to determine if his player would even have a clue, he had been setting this up for a while, in character, so he had made sure his character knew just enough chemistry that this would be easily possible. For those of you who don't know, knack is a metal alloy, liquid at room temperature, just like mercury but horribly explosive when in contact with water. A small vial about the size of a golf ball explodes like a hand grenade. This stuff ignites automatically with just the water in the air. MFWI finally understood what he was trying to do. The entire table was laughing so hard they were crying at what they expected was going to just wipe out the BBEG way early into the campaign. I had one final ace up my sleeve. Math. To Google. We all worked on this, figuring out the explosive power of knack and water when combined, the explosive potential, and the size of the explosion. The numbers kept adding more zeros. My players faces when they realized the scale of their effort. An hour later, we finally had it staring us in the face. Numbers that were almost incomprehensibly large. My Dwayo masks if he has enough time to jump through the portal and close it behind him. Roll initiative. 14. Fine. You get to react. Other party members that were miles away? Vaporized instantly. The rest who were in the tavern in town? They felt the ground rumble, heard the explosion, and saw all the shattered glass. The largest non-nuclear detonation in history pales in comparison to this. Nearly TPK'd if it wasn't for the party cleric who was away that session, so was in the tavern. No one ever attempts such a thing again. The transmute liquid spell is practically walled away in a shrine to never be used again by universal unsaid agreement. TLDR. As DM I used an hour of math to scare my players into outlawing a simple spell as it goes against their definition of war crimes. Edit 1. For those wondering, the rest of the lake was still water, so. Plenty of reaction material. Also Dwayom had mentioned specifically that they spread it thin, like a sheet under the water so maximum surface area. They had been studying chemistry on YouTube recently, which was where they got the idea. FML. But rule of cool, I had to allow it once. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos.
Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.